Okay, good morning everyone. Um, I see there are a lot less people than last time, which is kind of understandable. Um, welcome to the second lecture in System Dynamics and Complexity. Before we start, I want to clear some administrative issues, which were bothering me quite a lot uh, in the last two weeks. So first of all, I'm not a professor. And uh, you please don't call me professor. It kind of makes me feel uncomfortable, and I'm also tempted not to correct you, which is not nice. So don't call me a professor. Um, now, seriously, there are still people without groups, and it's not really such a big problem as, as you might think. So if, if you're not assigned a group, I will do this. Uh, this is the easiest thing to do, and you will present. You will have your chance to present. I'm just uh, waiting to see who decides to stay with the course and who decides to drop it. And as you know, there are like, I think, two weeks uh, after the semester starts. Um, so there is a huge flux of, of, of people. It's difficult. It's somehow difficult to assign groups because people drop out and stuff like that. But um, hopefully most of you have groups. Who doesn't have a group assigned? Oh, wonderful. All right. Any questions about administration? Uh, there was one post on the forum, and apparently I did not make it clear how these handouts are going to be distributed. Um, I think th there is something in the first lecture about it. You will get it the night before, 6, 7 p.m. And the reason is not that we want you to have no time to read them and prepare in, in some way. The reason is that basically I'm still working on these handouts. Uh, it's it's not that you know there is this cupboard where we take all the slides year after year, they change constantly, and um, there's there's no other way to to post them earlier. If there are no more questions, I'll go on with the lecture. Today's lecture is, in my opinion, very intuitive. It's about the problem-solving cycle, how we identify problems, how we solve problems. It's more of a non-mathematical approach as opposed to what you may think this course is about, but it's, this is mostly kind of a management perspective. Um, and I think it would be easy for, for, for everybody. Um, there are trivial things, and I hope to kind of convey the message that even in trivial things, sometimes we can fall into certain traps. All right, so without further ado, let's start again. I would like to repeat what this course is about because, in my opinion, if you know, if you can tell what course you're taking in five sentences, if you tell the purpose of the course, then you've really understood and you can, uh, you can do well on the exam. So the course is really about three things, finding solutions, implementing solutions, and controlling these solutions. That's all. Finding solutions is topic of systems engineering, how to define your system, how to define your situation, Implementing solutions is topic of uh, project management. This is uh, coming in the, in the next lectures. And as I mentioned, these two parts would take about a third of the course. The last one is about controlling solutions, understanding how the system works and why it doesn't and so on. And this is where systems dynamics and nonlinear dynamics, chaos, unpredictability, things like this come into play. Last lecture. Um, we dealt extensively with the topic why problems are not simple. And hopefully now you know why problems are not simple. They have ill-defined problem space, no known algorithm to solve them, multiple conflicting objectives, contradicting but correlated demands. <coughs> and we will be interested in exactly those problems, not in the trivial, uh, well-defined problems. And hopefully, uh, I gave you a flavor of what we're going to mean by complexity. Complexity is not going to be something that you can simplify or can abstract away, reason away, negotiate away, or stuff like that. Complexity is going to be system property. So we're dealing with systems and with problems which exhibit complexity. And with complexity come the notions of unpredictability and chaos. But this is the, the last part. I gave you a flavor of the problem-solving cycle, uh, or 
a, a one way to solve a problem, which was this iterative procedure, if you remember the traveling salesman problem. Um, we also incorporated the, the notion from evolution, where we have random mutations and recombinations. And finally, we ended with, with kind of the message that in most real life situations, all these kind of are hard to apply because we need human problem solvers, which means no defined endpoint. We don't know when to stop this refinement and this constant negotiations and discussions and, and things like this. Um, and um, the problem solving cycle will hopefully give you a kind of a framework to, to make this human problem solving easier. Okay. So before that, um, I'm we talked a lot about how problems have multiple solutions, this kind of uh, multiple criteria optimization. And uh, <coughs> we don't know the best solution, and we're not even sure it exists. If it exists, we're not even sure if we can find it. Um, the point I want to make is that this is not something bad in real life that we try to deal with by, by this course. Or, or by thinking about it. We're not trying to address something bad in life. That's the point. Because imagine what will happen if problems were not that complicated and complex in real life. If they had one best solution, everybody knew this best solution, and um, there was no need even to think about it. So if you imagine this, then probably you can expand this list, but this is just an example of what may happen. So everybody would like to, to move in into the best apartment to marry the same woman or man, or somewhere in between, I don't know. Uh, they would want to make, well, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I've seen, uh, I've seen things. Um, all, all political parties, <laughs> okay, no offense. All political parties would, would like to make the same argument we would know what the best political system is. Um, we would have the same products and things like this. So you can expand this list by yourself. If there, is no, if there are no multiple solutions available, this is what's going to happen. And in essence, complexity, this kind of undefinedness of, of the solution space, complexity leads to diversity. Diversity in products, diversity in political strategies, diversity in, in people's opinions. And ultimately, I think diversity leads to progress. Because without diversity, without this kind of multiple products, for example, you wouldn't be able to have a market where people compete. So invisible hand wouldn't work. Uh, and we wouldn't be able to be creative. So this is not something that we'd like to thing as a bad thing, which we're addressing with this problem solving cycle and this kind of stuff. It's something that is good and we'll embrace this, this notion. So let's start with the problem solving cycle. What is the problem solving cycle? In fact, if you, if you go to Wikipedia and you Google, uh, well, Wikipedia problem solving, um, problem solving turns out to be the most complex intellectual function that, that, that beings are able to do. So it, it seems like problem solving, although you, most of us don't really realize it, is uh, the highest cognitive function in a way. So it's, it's something really, really good if I think about it. Um, <coughs> the problem solving cycle will give you a general approach or framework how to solve a problem. First, how to define your problem, how to generate solutions, how to implement these solutions, and then how to control these solutions. Uh, it's so general that almost every industry or management discipline has it in one way or another. We'll look at, um, at this notion, uh, abbreviation similar, you'll see what it means. It's just the problem solving cycle from uh, systems engineering perspective, the organization of systems engineers. It's on the next slide, I'll show you. But it's just a different name for the same thing. And the idea of, of iterations, you know, you start and, and you define your problem, you come up with, with proposals, you evaluate these proposals, maybe you go back in the beginning when new information becomes available. This idea comes um, from the ancient Greeks uh, with the so-called uh, maiutics. Do you, do you know what it means, this, this philosophical notion? Yes. 
exactly. So, yeah, it's exactly what you said. The idea is that every human somehow knows the truth in uh, some kind of an innate reason. So somehow you know what the best thing to do is. You just need to be directed in finding it. So how you know it, it it's the, the philosophy doesn't say, but if you're asked the right questions by an experienced, let's say, uh, psychologist, then you will realize where whether your thinking is wrong, and when you realize this, you would be able to find the true answer. So the idea that you somehow know uh, know this 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 truth um, is is basically myotics. And what you need to do is just to start iterating, asking the right questions, uh, coming coming up with answers, evaluating these answers, and then asking the right questions again. So this kind of cycle is basically what the problem solving is about, and. Um <coughs> Yes, yeah, so midwifery, uh, you know, midwives, they, they help women give birth. And the idea of myotics is that you help people give birth to the truth because somehow it's already inside of them. You just help them to find it. So uh, the reason why we midwifery is, is mentioned is that the, the words in Greek, myotics and midwifery, are somehow similar. So probably one derived from was derived from another. Okay, as I mentioned, it gives you a framework how to solve uh, a problem, so you can think of it as uh, steps that you need to do. Counterintuitively, though, there is still room for creativity, and we'll see this. So you may think that a rigid procedure you should think in this way would limit your creativity, but um, in fact, this is not the case. And not usually, but always, unless for the problem is very simple, uh, always uh, it's uh, iterative in nature. So quick words about this similar thing. It's uh, state the problem, investigate the torrent, this model, the system, and so on. This is the definition of the problem-solving cycle from um, INCOSE, the International Council on Systems Engineering. They have a lot of information on their website. But essentially, this is what, the, what they think the problem-solving cycle should be. It's just one particular um, interpretation of, of a more general framework. State the problem which means accumulate all inputs from all stakeholders, understand uh, how different people see the problem, and then finally come up with a, with a problem statement that more or less captures what everybody thinks. Investigate alternatives, alternative solutions. Um, modeling is very important here. here. Here's where modeling comes into play. We need to represent this real-life problem You'll see a nice real-life example later on, but we need to represent it in some kind of an abstraction to be able to deal with it. We talked about this in the last lecture, and there would be four more lectures on modeling to come up. And then so on. Launch the system, assess performance. Um, so this is just one, one implementation. But in the most general way uh, to look into it is these three parts. The problem-solving cycle is really these three parts. So in a sense, the whole lecture could be just this slide. It's setting the objective, meaning what, 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 what is it that you want to do. Um, search for possible solutions, generate solutions, evaluate solutions, and finally, um, select the right solution. And each of these steps could be further broken down into um, sub-steps, for example, uh, we'll look into this in details, but for example, before you set the objective, so what do you want to do, first you need to understand uh, what, what is your current situation. It's, it's a no-brainer. And then only can you formulate the objective. For example, imagine your boss comes into, into the office and says, uh, we have a problem. The problem is that the profits are going down. What do we have to do? So can you... Can you really set an objective based on this definition of a problem? Not really. So first you need to analyze why the profits are going down, so it's situation analysis, and only then can you formulate objectives. All right. <coughs> so uh, just a flavor of the self-study. Um <coughs> the self-study is about the problem-solving cycle. Uh, it's split in two parts the first two steps of the problem-solving cycle, namely 
situation analysis and generation of solutions would be the this week or next week, and then next next week would be the actual selection of solution. So, and and in fact, with the self study, you would really get the chance to practice this problem solving cycle. It's a very nice case like structure. Uh, it's uh, it's actually a realistic case. It's not a made up thing. Um, you would play different roles, and it's going to be very interesting. Um, imagine we have an airport. In this case, is let's imagine it's a Zurich airport. In fact, it was the Munich airport, but let's now imagine it's a Zurich airport. Uh, and you want to expand the capacity uh, of, of this airport. So th you have multiple ways to do this. You can either build new runways, or you can extend existing runways. And each of these decisions would affect basically everyone, the environment, the stakeholders, the common public, in different ways. You will generate different levels of noise, different levels of pollution, um, and you need to take care of, of all these interests at the same time. Uh, this is the self-study, what, what it's all about. Um, and to show you that this is actually a real case that people were trying to solve, this is a picture taken from the Tagesan Tiger. Uh, it's five years ago, I think, or four years ago, yeah, 2007. And you see, this is, this is what they presented. It's exactly the same issue. We have the current situation. This is, this is a runway. And you need to expand the capacity. So you can either extend, you can either extend these red things, extend the, the existing runways, or you can build new ones. It's actually a combination of building a new one and extending the current ones. And then here what they've done, they've evaluated, uh, so this is, let's say, number of landings per year, I think. Yes. And this is the noise that they calculated uh, each, each uh, solution will have. So you see, if we extend, uh, I if we build new runways, we would be able to, to have more planes landing at larger noise levels, which is not good. So this going to the right is good for, for, for the policymakers. They would get more planes. But at the same time, going up is bad for the public living nearby. So this kind of balancing, uh, balancing act you have to do in the self-study. And I even believe that uh, you can also find uh, the results of all these discussions online because I'm not sure if the discussions are over yet. Um, it was four years ago, so I haven't checked. Maybe, maybe they found uh, they've come up to a conclusion. So it would be interesting to compare what you come up with uh, with what they came up with. Yes. So this is the self-study. We need you, you need to apply the problem-solving cycle to to these airports. As I mentioned, this week or technically next week, we'll deal with with uh, setting the objective. Okay, so it's the other way around. This week, it's only going to be setting the objective, and then the second part is um <coughs> searching for a solution and, and selecting a solution. And this, I, I find this self-study more or less one of the best in the whole course because it's very realistic. Uh, when we get to the modeling, you need to, to be able to appreciate why we model things to to appreciate the self-studies themselves. But if you don't, you can still enjoy this one because it's very, real, uh, very realistic. All right. So let's, uh, let's uh, dig deeper into, into each step of the problem-solving cycle. The first one was setting the objective. And setting the objective could be split in two parts. First, as I mentioned, we need to analyze the exact problem that we're trying to solve. We, I mean, it's a no-brainer, but uh, take this example with your boss walking in. Um, y you need to be composed and to actually not panic and start understanding what your boss is really telling you, what the problem is really about. So scrutinize the problem, understand why the profits are going down. Uh, of course, be aware of constraints. Uh, you need to be aware of how your actions may be limited because this would influence your creativity in the solution phase. Um, so it's good to know it in advance. And then we move on to analysis of the current situation. 
So it's this typical idea, we analyze where we are now and where do we want to get in whatever time frame and then how to get there. And this is contains of, of four parts. We need to define, this is where system, the system thinking comes into play. We first, we need to define our system. What are we going to be concerned with? For example, if your problem is in, in the supply chain, for instance, you're not concerned with marketing or human resources, or you are concerned with finance uh, in one way or another, but not with marketing and human resources. So your system, your, in a way, your scope of interest will not include these things. So you need to define what is your scope of interest. You need to define what is outside of your scope of interest, environment, in other words. Um, <coughs> analyze the system and relevant, le uh, relevant parts of the environment is the next step. So once you've defined uh, your scope and the environment, you start analyzing mostly mostly things within your scope, but also how they, they feed back with your environment. We'll see an example. You do the normal strength weaknesses analysis. And um, uh, important, the last part, uh, probably, I is there a computer scientist here? You are a computer scientist, so you probably know about this, how you should always consider, even at the design phase, you should always consider what may change, what is likely to change in the future, because this would, in a way, direct how you, how you solve the problem. So no magic numbers and, and things like this. All right. <coughs> what happened here? All right. So before we uh, we move with defining system environment borders, um, first we need to take care of or think about what exactly is our our scope of interest or our system. And in the most generic way, so first of all, what what is a what, what is a system? The most general basic definition that you can come up with after all that we've seen so far. What, I what is a system? It's a something that I think is good to know for this course. Anyone? Interrelationship, so the system is just the interrelationships between the parts. Are the individuals part of the system or just their interrelationships? No, uh, they are part. Yes, so basically a system could be seen as simply a collection of interacting elements in, in the most, uh, in the simplest way. And I can give you a hint that um, something like this would probably come up on the exam. You know, basic things like what is a system or... Um, what is modeling? And you don't need to be uh, to, to, to write paragraphs and paragraphs of explanations. One sentence, which is just makes sense with your own words, is more than enough. All right. <coughs> so a system is simply a collection of interacting elements. And you're free to model <coughs> everything within this system. You're free to model your elements. You're free to model their interaction. You're free to model... Uh, well, uh, that, that's, that's pretty much all. Uh, but uh, think about, for example, your supply chain problem. You want to solve some bottleneck. The elements in this system would be something like plants or machines or workforce. Uh, the, interactions, uh, uh, the interactions may be how, let's say, how many machines one plant has and, and things like this. So this is more of a operational perspective. You define your system based on uh, on how it's structured. But for example, if you want, if your problem is make my company more adaptable or make it less inert, then your elements would not be plants and, and machines. Your elements may be decision processes or process flows. So this kind of ab more abstract things. So as you can see, I mean, every uh, your elements and your system may be completely abstract entities. It doesn't prevent you from solving, from solving a problem. 
Um, furthermore, this is not a flat picture. Element, 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 they interact, we have a system on a flat surface. What we actually have is a hierarchy. So you can have systems within systems, within systems, within systems, and uh, the, I mean, basically, this is the picture. Um, <coughs> so depending on on which level you zoom into, uh, you you may consider something to be an element on one level and then to be a whole system on another level. And in your notes, you have the prototype or the, the most common example with the human, how the human can be considered a system, collection of cells, but also an element in a in a economic system, for example. And this is, in fact, I, I would say we start with microeconomics here and we slowly go to the macroeconomics. This is how you can think about the link between micro and macroeconomics. <coughs> okay, so we've defined our system, our scope of interest. We've defined the most important elements, whatever that is. Humans, machines, abstract notions, God, I don't know. And then we're, we're ready to move to... Um, defining what the borders of the systems are, of the system are, and what the environment is, um <coughs> and there are bas basically two two approaches that you can use. You can use the so-called, or I call it, the first one uh, within the system perspective, which means that you are inside the system and you define where does the system end and where my environment starts. There is an illustration on the next slide that, that I, I'll illustrate this. So you're within, within the system and you simply limit, let's say, your scope. I mean, your scope will be limited by your uh, cognitive abilities or by your uh, time constraints. So what can you actually influence? And then everything else is environment. We saw a more kind of a physicist perspective on, on uh, system environment. Uh, delineation, which were open, closed system, and isolated systems. So these are definitions from physics uh, that are kind of, it, it takes certain amount of imagination to apply them to real life. Um, open system, exchange, matter, energy, and information. Uh, closed system, for our purposes, so in the physics sense, they only exchange information, uh, but the point is that in a closed system, you cannot have movements of, of the elements in or out. So if you consider the economy as a closed system, and if you consider that the economy consists of people, a closed view on the economy would mean that no people can come out or in from the economy. Information can flow, but not, not matter, not, not the elements themselves. And isolated systems, which almost don't exist in, in, in the real world, unless you consider the universe to be a system, uh, do not exchange anything. So this is just a kind of a, a more uh, abstract definition of, of system and environment. So this is open, closed, isolated. All right. Now more about the uh, delineation between environment and system. This is an illustration of um, in a sense, I wouldn't say the whole problem-solving cycle, just the first two parts, but it means the following. As, as, as I told you, first we define the system, and then normally what happens, the problem that you're trying to solve is a subset of your system. And I'll give you an example. Imagine that this is the economic system, the green thing. Yes, the green thing is an uh, is economic system. And your problem that you're trying to solve is high oil prices, for instance. I mean, hopefully, uh, hopefully one person can solve this. But let, let's imagine that this is the problem. And obviously, this solving, uh, dealing with high oil prices is just part of the economic system. The economic system has many more problems than high oil prices. All right, so this is your problem. In addition, the amount of impact that you may have, depending on who you are, of course, but the amount of impact that you can have is even less than the problem size. Okay, so for example, if you are um, just one individual, uh, 
your ability to influence this problem is probably very limited. So you're in the so-called intervention zone. Which parts of the problem you can, uh, you can actually uh, enhance is very limited. If you're Saudi Arabia, for example, probably uh, this intervention zone would be much bigger. It would probably encompass the whole problem. If you're, um, yeah, I mean, uh, any other country would probably be less than Saudi Arabia, so. Uh, okay. And then, in most cases, again, unless you're Saudi Arabia, but in most cases, the actual solution that you can come up with would be even less or even smaller than the intervention zone. Because just think about it, you may be able to do a lot of things in theory. So inter your intervention zone uh, may be kind of wide, but the actual things that you can do in practice would normally be less than that. You may be not able to just stop produ producing oil or increase production of oil to decrease prices due to political reasons or trade agreements and whatnot. So normally this, would, this is what, what's, what's going to happen. Your solution, uh, your, your actual, this is your actual impact. Think of it as, as this. Solution zone is your actual impact. Intervention zone is your potential impact. And this is the problem, this is the system. And now a funny thing happens. You, you, you've defined all these things, you implement your solution, and then what you see is that your solution uh, creates new problems, right? So before this was your problem, and now your problem is this. So you've created a new problem, uh, which I think most of you would agree with. Often we, we think we've solved something, we solve it, and we create something new. Or we don't solve it and we still create something new. I don't want to give examples because uh, it's, it's recorded, but I have nice political examples, so we can talk about this later. I, I would have liked to give them, but I'm not sure how people would react. <laughs> All right. I mean, just for example, think that... Um, uh, well, no. Okay, let, let's move on. <laughs> All right. No, I, it's nice to try to think in, in, in real life terms about all these things. So um, how, how trivial it may seem, well, we have a problem, we have solutions, uh, and, and in fact, it happens every day, and it's not as trivial as you may think. Okay. Um, in more details, or this is the, uh, the second part of the task analysis, we need to analyze the system and uh, the relevant, only the relevant parts of the environment, right? This is, uh, here we have more or less uh, aggregated idea of what is, it, yeah. No, no, th these are just like particular actions that you can take. Come again? Either that, or you may think it like this. Uh, this is an action I need to do, and then after I do this, I need to do this one, and then this one, and then things like this. So it's, it's, it's any notion of action that you can come up with. Mm <coughs> so this was more or less an aggregated perspective on, uh, yeah, we have a system, we have a problem zone, we have possible intervention zone. Uh, but in fact, when you analyze the environment, for example, you need to analyze the influence of the environment on your system. You don't really analyze the whole environment. Somehow you need to model the environment as well. Environment is too abstract to be useful. So this is, uh, oh, so first of all, I apologize. This is reversed, right? So the, what is this color? Orange needs to be actually investigation, uh, intervention area investigation intervention is the same and uh, the yellow one should be the system so uh, correct that and this is taken from a from a paper written by a student where uh, where he analyzed uh, i think it was an electronic healthcare system 
the point the point of 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 what exactly he did is is irrelevant what is important is the following so for him oh, l- l- let's 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 start in a different way imagine uh let's say me and you we have the same goal we both want to improve the patient's quality of life all right this is our goal and we we both can think about it and come up with with a solution how to do it and let's imagine this is me and this is you so we have the same let's call this the universe i mean the, the collection of everything that exists within the system and outside the system is our universe in in a sense so for example you can have what influences our healthcare system well of course legal conditions of course funding so legal conditions influence the funding funding of course influence as, as we all know influences the type of treatment that you will get or you will not get um uh well, what else for example the complaints by by patients or by doctors uh influence the data that you record and so on and so forth it's not uh, this is not so important we have this is our universe okay and i define my system so the thing that that is within my scope of interest as uh what is it as the yellow one so i care only about consulting i care about uh, so consulting providing advice to doc maybe i'm a medical consultant so i provide uh advice to doctors i provide advice to hospitals on best manage- management practices things like this consulting um support and provisions and i care about the social environment whatever that means So this is the system for me or my scope of interest what I can actually influence within that scope of interest maybe even more limited as you saw it's I I may only uh, be able to influence consulting and support um and then the solution that I will come up with to improve patient's quality of life um <coughs> may have to do with improving management practices in hospitals for example by educating uh, by educating uh, managers and doctors or proposing some kind of <coughs> it's very popular this kind of private public cooperation uh where the hospitals are managed by professional managers not by doctors things like this you on the other hand may be um i mean you may be an let's say an IT IT firm IT con- SAP for example and then th- your scope of interest will be um for example data acquisition how you store the data from complaints or whatever data in the patient's records so on and so forth uh where you store it how you acquire it um again consulting and usability and so on and your scope of of uh, let's say ability to to change something uh may only have to do with the IT part of it would i don't know usability of of uh yeah of whatever and then data acquisition and so on and then the solution that you may come up with will probably have to do with building better infrastructure digital infrastructure for exchanging medical records and uh storing patients medical history and so on and so forth so you see depending on how first of all on what who we are what we can do what our interests are we come up with completely different solutions to the same problem and both of them are good both of them um in a sense deserve to be implemented so um <coughs> yeah that's it the next part of the task analysis is so after we've defined our system we've defined our environment we've defined what exactly we can do what we can do uh we move to defining the the so called yeah strength and weaknesses so you have to understand um where you are and what you need to change what you don't need to change it's a typical uh, the most popular swot analysis uh pest analysis portfolio analysis things that you will do at length in other courses you will also have to do them in the fourth in the fourth self study is just to give you a little flavor of of these things and um 
I remember uh, I, when I was doing this MS degree, uh, there was a... Um, it's not as trivial as it may sound. This is my point. You may be tired of hearing this as uh, strength, weaknesses. It's so easy. But in fact, um, there was a consultant invited for one of the courses. I think it was strategic management. And then I asked him, well, how often is this SWOT analysis used in practice? And he said, well, not very often. I said, why? Uh, and then he told me, the thing is that if you ask different people within a company to do a SWOT analysis, it's very simple. Strength, weaknesses, opportunities, threats. What is a strength for one person may be a weakness for another one. So you would get a completely uh, conflicting situation analysis. Com or, um, it's part of situation analysis. Yeah. So you, you would get completely conflicting things. And then this would obviously create problems with uh, <laughs> defining your actual problem. So it's just uh, something to keep in mind. Uh, don't underestimate how easy this is to do, but also don't overestimate its potential impact because it's uh, in practice, yeah, it's limited. <coughs> All right. And finally, as I mentioned, future development. So you need to this is still part of situation analysis, by the way. The first part of the problem-solving cycle. It's very important to do it now because when you identify things that may eventually change in the future, you will come up with different solutions eventually. You would come up with solutions which are adaptable, which are not rigid. Um, and it's very important, as, as any computer scientist will tell you, for example. All right. <coughs> And yes, forecasting systems dynamics uh, is basically this. You try to predict in an intuitive way how your system would behave, how your environment would behave, and how the, the feedback between them would behave. You can do SWOT analysis uh, for evaluating solutions, that's true. And this would also be part of the problem solving cycle when we, when we get to evaluating solutions. But before you can actually come up with solutions, uh, you need to answer the questions, solutions to what? And this question is what motivates doing SWOT at this point of time. So, for example, if, if you have a very uh, large market share. This is your situation. I have a very, very large market share. And you may think this is a strength, in which case we don't have a problem and we don't need a solution. But one, your boss, for example, or your colleague may think that this is a weakness because this is, in fact, let's say a saturated market without future, in which case we have a problem and we need to do something. So it's, it's worth doing the SWOT um, on your situation, which motivates your problem and eventually your solutions. Uh, did I hear a, a bell? Was there a bell? Uh, there is one minute or one minute. Okay, so let's stop here for a break because this starts actually the, the second part of the problem solving cycle. So I don't want to stop this progression. Oh, okay, well. <laughs> let's continue. Um, a few words. Administrative again. I was reminded of something. Uh, we're going to have online tests, three online tests after the fourth the eighth and before the exam. So three online tests, you only need to pass two. Uh, and as I mentioned, there would in the beginning there would be a lot of time and open book, everything would be open. You just need uh, internet access. All right. Oh, I need to turn this on. So now we've finished with um, 
analyzing the situation. This was part of uh, this. This was part of the first uh, sub point. Uh, let's see this one. So we finished with. So the first, the first point, the first uh, part of the problem-solving cycle is situation analysis in the most general sense. The first subpart was task analysis, so identifying what your system is, what your problem is. The second part is now that we know exactly where we are, what can we influence, what can we not influence, what our constraints are. Now, only now can we define our objectives. What do we want to do? And this is the step 1.2, so the second sub-part of the first um, part of the uh, problem-solving cycle, setting the objective. And um, this, I, I got a question in the break about when do we exactly start implementing the solution and we hand something to the customer. And we know this is the best possible solution given all our constraints and this is what we give to the customer. And this has a lot to do with this part, with setting the objectives. Because the objectives would be the basis on which you evaluate your solution. And this sounds trivial at first glance. Of course, we need to have uh, an objective in order to evaluate solutions. But um, often it happens that objectives and goals are vague, not defined explicitly. A PhD is a perfect example of this. Um, I can attest. And um, eventually you end up with, with a bad solution. So uh, the objectives, in most cases, they're, although the word means objective, something that is invariant to, to, to different interpretations, they are defined in a very subjective way because everybody has different interests, everybody has different ideals, and consequently everybody has different goals, different objectives. We need to be able, we need to know this in order to balance things out. Um, again, you can think about many different examples of what an objective could be. Um, these three classes of objectives are more or less the more, uh, the, the more common. So procedural objectives which regard the process workflow. So how do we want to implement our, our process um, or, or a, let's say a production line, manufacturing line. Uh, there are also objectives regarding the end product of your system, a product, uh, something that you produce, so how this thing should look like. And again, there are mandatory objectives that you need to do and uh, nice to have or desired objectives. In the most simple way, you can define objectives in the following algorithm, if you'd like. The system has to have certain properties within these specifications in the given time frame. For example, the, the instance here is, I'm a runner, I want to be fast, fast meaning, yeah, I want to run 100 meters less than 9.78 seconds, and I want to accomplish this, to be able to do this in one year. But of course, you can come up with more realistic uh, examples. I want to have a product which is cheap, whatever price, in, in two years, for instance. So this is kind of a generic way to formulate objectives. Um, and I mean, it, it, it works in a lot of cases where you normally you wouldn't think it works. And in the self-study, if you try to use this, things would be somehow a lot easier. At least they, they were for me when I, when I was doing it. All right. So what, um, what, what should an objective look like exactly? Mm, a very important thing, an objective should not mention anything about the solution. Anything. You, you shouldn't think about whether this is possible uh, well, you should think about whether this is possible or not, but you shouldn't think about how to do it. Um, for example, with the airport, uh, with the airport case, a bad objective would be uh, something like 
we can only build a new runway and there's no other way to, to expand the capacity, so let's figure out how to do it exactly. This is an objective which already hints into, the, into a solution. It's a very bad thing, so never do it. The objectives, importantly, should be measurable or quantifiable. You should be able to measure something with real numbers. What you can't measure, you can't control. I think this was the saying. Um, so the objectives should be measurable. Running fast is not measurable, or high quality product is not measurable. Defects per million is measurable though. Okay, the objectives should be complete and balanced. What does that mean? Complete meaning all the stakeholders involved should have given their goals, should have given their opinions, and you should have collected all the objectives from the different sides uh, that come into the problem. Um, balanced means that you shouldn't have very important objectives and very insignificant or trivial objectives in the same kind of catalog of objectives. So you shouldn't have an objective like um, we want uh, one DPM for our product and an objective which is the internal code name of, of our product should be, I don't know, uh, chair, something like this. So they should be balanced. Contradiction free is obvious, no contradicting objectives because this eventually locks you into, into not being able to solve anything. No, no repeating objectives, obviously. And um, an important thing also, prioritization. Often it happens that individual objectives are at odds with the system's objectives, with the overall welfare of, of the system. Probably you can think of a lot of examples. Economic examples are the most common ones. Tragedy of the commons, if you've heard of this prototypical uh, example of, of of the conflict between individual and uh, system wide system wide objectives. You need to prioritize. Yeah. What, what would be a reasonable thing? No, redundancy free means you shouldn't have repeating objectives which are more or less the same, just reformulated differently. For example. A high quality, well, high quality product is not a good objective, but um, I mean, yeah, that's that's basically what it means. And uh, yeah, priority, giving priorities is also very important because later on, if your solution is targeted towards one of these priorities, and somebody comes to blame you, this was a bad solution, this was a bad thing, you can justify your solution by referring to your priorities. And blaming you on your priorities is, in general, more difficult to do than blaming you on the results of your solution. All right. <coughs> so there are different techniques of formulating objectives. We'll look into, I think, three. <coughs> one, one is uh, the so-called objectives catalog. So this is a very simple idea. Often you would end up with so many objectives or goals. Think of objectives as goals or desires. Uh, from so many different people, I mean, the MAS students would probably immediately uh, recall an example um, that it may be difficult to simply process all this information. So it's useful to split all these objectives into different classes um, of, of objective or objective classes. And the example here is uh, with a car. You want to produce a car and the car should be should have a high quality, so that's a bad objective right there. High, qu high quality should have whatever uh, amount of airbags, I don't know what consumption, purchase price, brand color, and we can create the following objective classes for each of these objectives. Safety, cost, prestige, and then we assign priorities to the objective classes. And then we deal with objective classes later on. This is one, one technique for formulating objectives. Another one, so this, yeah, so another one evaluates the objective relationship matrix, evaluates the contradicting aspect, what I mentioned, contradiction-free. So it evaluates 
whether you have contradicting objectives or not. Because sometimes it's, it's not trivial to identify them at, 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 at first glance. So this is in German, unfortunately. Um, but the point is the following. On both, on both sides, you have the same objectives. And you put a zero here. Um, <coughs> if if uh, the, the two objectives, so that one and that one, do not influence each other. Uh, no, sorry. You put a zero if there is a conflict between these two objectives. You put a one if the two objectives do not influence each other at all. So you can do them at the same time. It's no problem. Um, and, and you put a two if the two objectives enhance each other. So by doing one, you would also contribute to, to accomplishing the second one. And I'll just give you an example. Um, the, the first row here is, um, yeah, it's in German, but it actually means reducing the acquisition costs, for instance. And if you take number two here, reducing, so this was reducing acquisition costs, and this is improving um, um, product availability. Uh, what, what, what is that? Oh no, let, let's take no, let's take this one because it's in English. After sales service. So reducing acquisition costs and after sales service are obviously not related. You can do them both at the same time. It's it's uh, it's not a problem. Um, however, if you take I th yes the third one, this is reducing storage costs. And you take, let's take one zero, for example, this one. So we go to this row, and we take that zero, and this thing is, uh, what is it, I have it here, oh yeah, so uh, increasing the availability of spare parts. Now, if, if, if you think more, more about this, you would see that they conflict each other. So reducing storage costs probably means that uh, you store less, you have less inventory, you pay less, um, which automatically means that the amount of spare parts that you may have available would decrease. So you cannot actually increase the availability <laughs> of spare parts. And the same thing for this zero. That zero which is uh, in improvement, improvement of product availability. So if you have less storage costs, meaning probably you store less, your inventory is less, uh, product availability May, may be uh, negatively impacted uh, at times of high demand. So things like this. You identify the, um, the, contradict the contradicting aspect of, of your objectives. Polarity profiles. You would probably see this a lot, and you've probably seen this a lot. You put all your objectives into kind of a n-dimensional space, and each, each arrow here uh, corresponds to an objective. And then you evaluate um <coughs> you evaluate the importance of each objective, and with this you can analyze your current situation and where you want to be so if you imagine that the 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 solid line is your current situation and the dotted line is where you want to be, you immediately see uh basically what what uh, how to focus your efforts. And an example, actually, again, I think it comes from the Tagesanzeiger. No, actually, I don't know where it comes from, but it comes from a, uh, from a newspaper about politicians. So apparently they asked these politicians, I think this was, yeah, this was a long time ago, six years ago. Probably some of you have heard of these politicians, I don't know. Uh, but this was actually in, 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 in a newspaper where they asked each politician to evaluate the importance of these following objectives. And I would I was just looking at this yesterday and I thought, okay, well actually let's let's pay attention to it and read it. So what, what was quite amazing to me is that if you look here, this one, this is this guy, Matthias Feller. And this says law and order. Law and order, and it doesn't seem to be important to this guy at all. Right? Compared to these guys. So that I mean that was a really interesting thing, and I didn't have time to actually Google this guy and 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 I mean, why wouldn't you care about law and order? I, I don't know. 
So yeah, uh, this is these are polarity profiles. It it gives you a nice it's yeah it's very intuitive a nice illustration of where you are where you want to be. <coughs> so this was formulation of objectives, what kind of objectives you should define and how to define them. Let's see what we've done so far. <coughs> we've analyzed the situation, meaning we've defined our system, we've defined our environment, we've defined how both interact, what part of the system we can influence, how our solution may, or how our actions may affect our environment. We've considered, hopefully, how all these things may change in the future. Uh, and we've formulated our objectives based on this uh, task analysis. The next part is search for solutions and selection of solutions. So search of solutions basically means generating as many solutions as possible. This is the solution synthesis. Uh, so you synthesize as many solutions as possible you generate a lot of diversity and then you narrow down everything uh, to one or two solution candidates and then you, um, uh, you make a selection in the, in the third part. So let's... Uh, okay, and, and then here, going back to this example with, with your boss coming and telling you that the profits are low and you should do something. After you've done this, hopefully you know, for example, that the profits are low because customers are not satisfied and then you know that your objective is to let's say increase customer retention for instance and this is a uh, solid yeah yes You um, this is, yes, you, you can basically do this. It's part of um, quantifying the objectives. So when you have to quantify law and order, it's basically you who come up with, with the numbers. And that's, that's the beauty of it, because it depends on humans. Uh, so it, there's no clear-cut way to do it. There's no clear-cut... Uh, Polarity profiles. It's 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 all it all depends on on human problem solvers. So yes, if you end up with a huge range of say for example this this objective is on a Likert scale one to six, another one is I don't know ten to twenty. Of course you normalize. Uh, these are kind of technicalities, uh, but the numbers you come up with them. So yeah, that that's a good point. No, normally how it works is you don't give people uh, the chance to to come up with their own quantification. So you don't go to these three different people and tell them, can you kind of come up with a with, with number by yourself, how important this is for you? You give them a scale. And I think this this is one, two, so this represents, okay, we also have inner circles. So I don't know the scale, but Yes, you, you, you make sure that everybody has the same scale. If you end up with some marketing research from different companies where they use different scales, then you need to normalize. But then again, the, the, the question is, um, I, I don't think normali normalization is subjective. It simply means that you shift everything to the same mean and, and that's it. It's 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 quite quantifiable. Okay. Now we move to okay to search for solutions. Second part. 
So, so far we didn't mention anything about solutions and we shouldn't think about solutions. We should only think about the what and not about the how. But now we need to search for solutions. What kind of solutions are there? We distinguish between the following two types. The first type is first order solution. This is a solution which exists within your system boundaries. So, in other words, in, in, in more trivial terms, it means do more of the same. For instance, um, the, uh, the heating problem. If, if you're cold in your room, doing more of the same or, or a first order solution would be to turn up the heating. If you're still cold, you do more of the same, you turn the heating up. And do this more and more until you either cannot turn the heating anymore, in, in which case uh, you certainly have still a problem, or you're satisfied. So this is the first order solution, turning up the heating. Um <coughs> Unfort well, yeah, I mean, often it happens that first order solutions simply exacerbate the problem. Um, second order solution would entail changing the system itself or, in other words, thinking outside of the box and all these kind of popular sayings, which means you change the system boundaries. And an example, with again, with the heating problem, maybe uh, instead of increasing your heating more and more, you simply build better isolation, for instance. This would be a second order solution uh, to the problem. And... Uh, <laughs> Uh, the examples here are the Gordian knot where Alexander the Great just, instead of untying a knot, he just cut it with his sword. Still did the job. Um, awaking from a nightmare. Instead of dealing with your feelings, you just, awa you just wake up and it's clear. Um, and a, a, a big mistake is that people sometimes try to change the order of this uh, fir employ first order solutions where second order solutions are needed. And w when, I was, when I was reading these slides a couple of days ago, I immediately thought about, um, so that's another political reference, but uh, it won't be uh, ironic, um, about the current way the EU is, is, is uh, dealing with the problem with, with, with Greece and with this extra debt of countries. What they do, they just do let's bail out more and bail out more and bail out more and now they're even thinking of bailing out the whole EU. So it's doing more of the same, doing more of the same and um, I don't know if that's the best idea. I don't know. So um, this is an example probably some of you are aware of, those of you who are aware of um, don't, don't say anything. Um, it's an example of connecting these dots in four straight lines. Can somebody do it? Yeah. Yeah, so this is basically the second order solution. Can you do it in three lines? All the dots connect, all, so in four lines, how can I show you? Yeah, for straight lines, so you basically go something like, I hope, uh, I hope you can follow. You go something like this, and then you go like this. What is it? Two, and then uh, what is it? Three and four. I think that was the the right thing. But can you do it in three lines? So this is a second order solution. Obviously, you break the system boundary. Nobody told you that you can't go out of the out of the margin, but you did, so it's breaking the system boundary. Can you do it in three lines? Which I would call is a third order solution. Okay, I mean, I googled this, I didn't come up with it, so. Yeah, I'm not trying to impress anyone. Yeah. Straight lines. Okay, that's such an uh, nth order solution that, yeah, I mean, you can do it. No, but the something funny is that if you imagine a line not going straight like this through the dots, but the line going a little bit tilted, 
right? So still falling within the dots, right? So it comes through here, and then the middle of this dot, and then the bottom of this dot. So a line going like that, slightly tilted. So it's like one, it comes to here. Then you do the same here, two, and then three, right? So you're using basically the size of the dots. You don't have what? Infinitely small. Uh, well, you 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 don't <laughs> you don't really need a hypothesis <coughs> because um, the definition of a problem is general enough for you not to so if you had some kind of restriction then you, you, you have to do kind of a hypothesis well let's assume that uh, the the dots are not infinitely small if if i gave you just point particles then you you make this assumption because obviously you have a restriction you don't see big dots but here you see big dots so okay my bad so I, i'll correct it 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 should be it should be uh dots but i uh, i think this this was the best solution with folding the paper it's nice topological thing okay now this is where the the creative part of the problem solving cycle comes a, as you just saw um and for this part there are least or uh, the fewest amount of procedures that are imposed by the uh, by the whole framework yeah second order solution so um it's it's it really ups to you so the on it's really it really up uh, is up to you so the only thing that that can be said in in this part is kind of a general advices of of how to be creative uh for example one general advice is do not just listen to customers suggestions um have you heard of this um management professor Clayton Christensen not yet but he he will be mentioned in the management courses so he wrote a very nice book which exactly addressed this point uh it's called the innovator's dilemma which talks about the dilemma between being a good company having good relationships with your customers listening to your customers needs and complaints trying to satisfy them at all times and the notion that sometimes customers don't know what they want uh sometimes you need to do something that your customers may not like in the beginning but eventually uh would appreciate and there are lots of um industries that went completely extinct due to not uh to due to disregarding this advice typewriters industry is a prototypical example so don't always listen to to your customers another thing again it's it's a repetition but there there is not the best solution there are multitudes of possible solutions which are equally good depending on the perspective this may sound trivial uh but in fact i'm still amazed how quickly people jump into judging uh a given let's say uh performance of a government for instance so they they quickly jump into saying this was a bad policy uh and the good policy is this this is the good policy but there is no such thing as this is the good and this is the bad they're equally good and you need to to uh, to evaluate them in the right context given evaluating the right um assumptions that were made and priorities we talked about priorities it's in general it's much harder to blame somebody on choosing the priority the priorities that they chose but it's much easier to blame them on the on the uh exposed result okay so this is uh, one thing yes how to search another advice be open minded um <coughs> yeah i, I yeah. 
Okay, I'll, I'll, I just have to tell you this example. Um, so yesterday, I was it yesterday? Yes, it was yesterday. I attended. Uh, have you heard of Richard Feynman, this physicist? You have heard. You also. Uh, most of you haven't, but it's, he's one of the most famous physicists of the 20th century. And there was a presentation in the Irhel campus about his life. And a distinguished, uh, distinguishing characteristic of this guy was his open-mindedness and even kind of aversion to system boundaries. And most, I think most of the creations uh, and progress in life has happened because of this, of trying to break uh, the system boundaries. So open-mindedness, always be open-minded. It's not, very diff it's not uh, always uh, easy to do this. Imagine if you have a brainstorming session uh, and you have five people brainstorming on a topic. Everybody comes with different proposals. You think this is, this is a good thing. But in fact, what happens is, and there, there is, has been research on this, um, that you are influenced by all these proposals and your own creativity and open-mindedness is limited. So a much better approach would be to have the people separated come up with their own ideas, then they meet and exchange ideas, then they're separated again, think more and meet again, than having them at the same room, uh, in the same room the whole time. So this is a, uh, just an example how you don't even realize when your open-mindedness is, is limited. And the important part in this step of the problem-solving cycle, so the, the, sec well, where were they? the second part, the concept, of the solution synthesis is you don't come up with a solution, you come up with solution variants, with many different solutions. There is no rule of thumb how many. It's up to you. It's, again, human problem solving. Okay. This is a, uh, wait, wait a second, I think I skipped a slide. Yes, I skipped this slide. <coughs> again, I said uh, synthesis, means generating more and more solutions or variety of solutions. Um, the analysis part of, of, the, of this second step is to evaluate these solutions. And the evaluation is based on the objectives. So you need to have your objectives quantified before you can actually start evaluating solutions. Um, so in this part, concept synthesis, it's important to create a variety of solutions. You need to have diverse solutions, and this goes back to, to the example with the brainstorming. If you have people brainstorming in the same room, you may not create the necessary diversity of solutions because open-mindedness is limited. In the next step, which is the analysis, your goal here is to limit this plethora of solutions to limit it. So you evaluate solutions based on, on your objectives, you discard some solutions, this do not accomplish the objective, this doesn't, and so on, and then you limit uh, kind of a funnel approach and you reduce the variety here. But you don't select anything, not yet. You simply remove the most obvious uh, things that, that wouldn't work. And this is a schematic representation of, of uh, basically the previous two slides. Uh, we've done already our situation analysis. We've defined our system. We've defined the current situation. We've defined our objectives. And now we start creating solutions. We create a solution. We evaluate it. We either modify it or we reject it. And we do this and, and so on and so forth. We end up finally with variety of solutions. And then in the last phase, we reduce this variety of solutions to just a few kind of solution candidates. Yeah. Just back, go back to the last. Could it be that you want to maybe want to remember and then you take the rest of the solutions and all brain find them? This is the this is the example with the traveling salesman problem in the first lecture. Where we the coarse grained approach was we start with a random graph and we start uh, mutating and removing links, and we've kind of go into a more fine-grained, um, let's say we go to a more optimal 
optimal or shortest path. Because the, the random graph is definitely most likely way too far from being optimal. And then we slowly start to evaluate. So I in essence, in, in, in other words, this means don't start to optimize every little detail and making it perfect. Just start from the big picture and have something that makes sense and then start to dig deeper and deeper and optimize things. This is what, what it essentially means. Yes, and then the evaluation is the third phase of the problem solving cycle. The second phase simply generates the end product of the second phase, the generation of solution candidates. And then the evaluation is the last phase. This is another schematic uh, about the whole process again. It's a bit more difficult to understand, so let me, um, let me try to explain it. The, the, um, the, do the, the circles, the empty circles, are possible solutions. The circles with a, s with, with a, with a letter, with a letter inside, are selected solutions. So not just C, but also A and, and B would be selected solutions. And this dot is unusable solution. So what it means essentially is the following. You start here. This is your starting position. Okay? You generate a lot of solution candidates, right? So this one is a possible solution. This one turns out not to be uh, possible. And then you, 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 you select your solution candidates. Then you make a choice. Okay, let's go with this one. This, this looks to be the best one. This is the first solution idea. You come to the realization that to implement it, you need to do all these things. Okay? So this is the idea. To implement it, you may need to do all these things. You see, this is the concretization part. So when you come to implementation, you, you realize, well, none of these things are actually viable. So what you do, you go back to the beginning. And you go into a different dimension. You, uh, you go into a different solution space somehow. And then these are different solutions. You select that one. This is the idea. You evaluate how easy it is to implement and how viable it is to implement. And you find out that this action here is a good one. It would actually implement it. And you do it and it's over. So it's a very abstract kind of a figure. But the point here is the cycle. This is the, the important point. You have a solution candidate. You see that it's not implementable. You go back to the beginning. And you start cycling through all solution candidates like this. OK. How, w what kind of um, traps can we fall into when we create solution candidates? I, uh, I would like to repeat this point. The avoiding of putting a solution hint into your objectives or into your design. So this, this is a very um, sometimes natural thing that happens. Uh, the example with the airport. We have only, we can only extend or we can only build a new runway and that's the only thing we can do. Let's see how to do it most efficiently. This should be avoided because it directs you, it directs you into a solution space that may end up completely, uh, completely unviable. And you would never be aware of this solution space, which may be extending. This may be extending the airport. This may be building a new runway. All right. <coughs> Again, important thing, quantifiable, uh, quantifiable uh, objectives. <laughs> yes, um, don't fall in love with your solution. I think we've all experienced this um, psychological effect that you tend to like your own proposal, you automatically tend to disregard other proposals. I myself have, have done this, this mistake uh, quite often. Uh, even though you don't realize it, um, the best thing to do is simply ask somebody you trust. Uh, don't fall in love with your solution. Okay, now, we have, um, 
we have done our concept synthesis, which is generating a lot of solution, and then the, this phase here, the analysis. We've narrowed down uh, the possible solutions. It's time, it's time to assess them. And um, basically, you don't the solution candidates that you have, you don't simply assess them and so you don't simply disregard suboptimal ones, but you rank them. You create a ranking. This, according to our objectives, is the best one, second best, third best, and so on. Because this thing is still open to discussion um, later on. Exactly, this is very important. Uh, the ranking is conditional on your objectives. <coughs> okay, so it's important, I mean, the, the procedure of having your objectives, having your solution candidates and evaluating them based on the objectives still needs to be defined. And this, this slide basically defines this. Uh, you need to evaluate your procedure. Uh, sorry, you need to define your procedure of evaluation. For example, uh, we've um <coughs> we, we for, for instance, we take these objectives um, and we apply them in that order to the solutions. So if, if the solution, so yeah, if the solution doesn't satisfy the fifth objective, uh, it's not as bad if the solution doesn't satisfy, for example, the first objective. Um <coughs> And this slide would make it actually a lot easier to, to understand. Let's assume you have, um, okay, one thing I wanted to mention actually here is, again, even in selecting your solutions, keep in mind future developments. This has a lot to do with, let's say, if you're a company and you want to purchase an information system solution from SAP, for instance, don't just think about the cost of the purchase, but think about the total cost of ownership how much it would cost you throughout the, the whole life cycle of the product. Okay, and this is an example. We have here a life, life cycle cost, and here we have um, whatever you think effectiveness can be measured with. For instance, I don't know if you have an instance. No, there is no example, but some quantifiable unit of effectiveness. Defects per million, for instance, I is one. And then for each solution, so here we have, right, and so this is the, the, the dotted line is the so-called objective function, which is, which is the cost, uh, which is the cost effectiveness function, which basically takes your two dimensions, life cycle cost and efficiency, and gives you a number, a single number, which is, um, which somehow weights these two criteria, right? This is one criteria, this is another criteria, and you need to give some weight to them. For example, if this is not important to you at all, the objective function would simply disregard it. And then you would only have high values here and low values here. So this is the function basically which weights your criteria. These are contour lines, meaning the objective function has the same value. So a solution here would have the same value to you as a solution here, but it would have different performance in terms of these two uh, in terms of these two objectives. And we have three solutions, A, B, and C. The solution A has uncertainty. I think this is the last slide, so yeah, it's the last slide, let me just finish it. The solution A has certain uncertainty. Solution C as well, solution B is actually quite, uh, quite certain. And you see that the solution B has very low effectiveness, but also very low life cycle cost. Your objective function, as a consequence, would be lower. Solution A has very high uncertainty. So you may end up actually here. And solution C may end up here. So in total, uh, I think if you run a contour line here, solution C may become better than solution A. So this is, uh, this is a way, a visual way to select, uh, to select your solution. 
and these are the questions after the lecture. And I'll see you next Tuesday. Thank you.